Hello, I'm Ron Wilson. In this month's news, the federal government has accepted all seven recommendations of Treasury's Retirement Income Streams Review, three of which refer to the present minimum pension drawdown rules and a further four which cover recommendations around encouraging the development of annuity-style retirement income stream products. The latest national accounts data show that Australia's economy grew by 1.1% in the March quarter and 3.1% over the year. And in international news, the US Federal Reserve left the federal funds target range unchanged at 0.25% to 0.5% at its June meeting. Michael Pollack has the details. As part of its 2016-17 budget, the federal government released the final report of the Federal Treasury's Retirement Income Streams Review, May 2016, and its response to the recommendations contained in the report. A review of retirement income streams was an election promise by the government in 2013, with a discussion paper subsequently released in July 2014. The government accepted all seven recommendations contained in the report. The current annual minimum drawdown requirements should be maintained. The Australian government actuary should be asked to undertake a review of the annual minimum drawdown rates every five years to ensure they remain appropriate in light of any increases in life expectancy. Any other changes to the minimum drawdown amounts should only be considered in the event of significant economic shocks. An additional set of income stream rules should be developed which would allow lifetime products to qualify for the earnings tax exemption. The alternative product rules should be designed to accommodate purchase via multiple premiums but additions to existing income stream products should continue to be prohibited. SMSFs and small APRA funds should not be eligible to offer products in the new category and a coordinated process should be implemented to streamline administrative dealings with multiple government agencies. The latest national accounts data show that the Australian economy grew by 1.1% in the March quarter and 3.1% over the year. This figure was above market forecasts for 2.8% annual GDP growth and the fastest expansion since the third quarter of 2012, according to the ABS. ABS figures indicated growth was driven by a 1.2% contribution from trade as export volumes of iron ore and gas surged as the final export phase of the mining boom kicked in. While public final demand was strong, private final demand fell 0.1% quarter on quarter and was up just 0.2% year on year as strength in consumer spending and dwelling investment continued to be offset by falling business investment. In contrast to growth in GDP, Real net national disposable income fell by 0.2% over the March quarter, leaving an annual decline of 1.3%. The ABS describes this measure as a broader measure of change in national economic well-being, and it indicates that Australian households are currently experiencing a decline in their purchasing power. The US Federal Reserve decided to leave the federal funds target range unchanged at 0.25% to 0.5% at its June meeting. The central bank signalled that it still planned to raise rates twice in 2016, however slower growth would restrain the pace of future monetary tightening. One of the primary indicators of slower growth was the release of weak employment data, which recorded a gain of just 38,000 in US payrolls for May. Seasonally adjusted GDP rose by 0.6% in the euro area for the first quarter of 2016, according to estimates published in early June by Eurostat, the statistical office of the European Union. For the broader EU28, Eurostat estimated GDP growth of 0.5% for the first quarter. One of the primary contributors to this GDP growth was household final consumption expenditure, which increased by 0.6% in both the Euro area and the EU28. The positive result for the first quarter suggests that the recovery remains firmly on track, with improving domestic demand continuing to fuel steady gains in the coming quarters despite concerns over the global economy. Research conducted by ASFA indicates that 22% of those who are self-employed do not have superannuation. While some self-employed are on track to secure a comfortable level of retirement income, the research found the majority of self-employed workers would struggle to achieve such an outcome. The ASFA research paper, Super and the Self-Employed, May 2016, found that approximately 10% of Australia's workforce were self-employed and that on average were older than wage and salary earners, with around 20% of the self-employed aged 60 years and over, compared with just 9% of the overall workforce. Owing to the absence of compulsory superannuation contributions, 
The research found that self-employed Australians aged 60 to 64 have about half the superannuation of employees. Approximately 27% of self-employed individuals in their 60s have more than $100,000 in superannuation, compared with 50% for employees. Unsurprisingly, the RBA kept the cash rate at 1.75% in its June meeting to allow its 25 basis point cut in May to filter through the economy. RBA Governor Glenn Stevens again flagged that inflation has been, and likely to remain, quite low. And given very subdued growth in labour costs and very low cost pressures elsewhere in the world, this is expected to remain the case for some time. Stevens also made specific mention of a very large decline in Australian business investment, despite other areas of domestic demand and exports expanding at or above trend. In April, the ATO issued Practical Compliance Guideline 2016-5, Income Tax, Arm's Length Terms for Limited Recourse Borrowing Arrangements, established by Self-Managed Superannuation Funds, or PCG 2016-5, which outline the specific conditions SMSFs must meet to avoid falling foul of the non-arm's length income rules. The ATO has extended the deadline from 30 June 2016 to 31 January 2017 for SMSF trustees to ensure that any existing non-bank LRBAs meet the safe harbour conditions as defined by the guideline. In brief, the guidelines set out the safe harbour terms on which the SMSF trustees may structure their LRBAs consistent with an arm's length dealing. For income tax compliance purposes, the Commissioner accepts that an LRBA structured in accordance with the guidelines is consistent with an arm's length dealing and that the non-arm's length income provisions do not apply purely because of the terms of the borrowing arrangement.